my name's Richard Moore. I run um, my own digital consultancy called Ignite Growth. And I also run a digital agency called Digital Media Edge uh, here in Lincoln. So um, I've got two hats really. One's very strategic, helping businesses get their growth strategy in place, have metrics and KPIs to measure that growth. And the other is very much once the strategy is in place, supporting them to execute. So it's very much that uh, execution and implementation piece that DME steps in on. So um, I do, I'm doing these um, workshops really under the Ignite Growth banner. Um, and as I say, I will start sharing my screen with you all um, and then we can crack on. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah, perfectly. Yes. Um, so what we're going to cover uh, today is very much the strategic part of modern business growth. Um, and it's uh, unlocking the power of data driven strategy. Um, to drive growth in a business so really the power i've always felt with digital and i'm 52 now so i've gone through the traditional business growth right through the digital age and um, seeing how social and digital can just allow us to measure every element um, dme is a hubspot agency as well i'll just talk a little bit about us um, my background was in the legal sector i was head of marketing in a large law firm and uh, we had seven um seven branches across the East Midlands. Uh, I did all their marketing, set up marketing campaigns, uh, Google AdWord campaigns, uh, a lot of the social media strategy was developed. Um, and then in 2015, um, well, probably earlier than that, actually, 2009, I left them, set my own business up, initially working in horse racing because that was my passion in life. And I wanted to really help race courses to embrace digital better, know who was coming through the turnstiles, how to engage with their audiences. So I worked with York Racecourse, Cheltenham Racecourse, uh, Southall Racecourse, where my brother's the head accountant. Um, and sort of did that for about four or five years. And then I got a lot of more corporate businesses asking me to support them with their digital growth strategies, how to use social media properly. Um, and that led to me setting up Digital Media Edge five years ago. Um, 2015, I set the business up um, just with myself and one other. Uh, and then we've slowly grown to four of us now. We don't really want to be much bigger because we, we, we like to be able to have the expertise in the areas we need. Um, and uh, we know that we really are supporting the business to grow. We're not taking over anyone's business. We're sort of in there to fill the gaps that they need to help them grow. So our approach is very strategy first. Um, we really get in depth and get very specific with clients about their revenue goals and um, what they're looking to achieve over the next five years. And then we reverse engineer that down into how many customers they need to achieve that. What's their average order values, how they're segmenting their segmenting their customer base, um, how many leads they need to generate, what their lead conversion rate is from lead into a customer, and then obviously how digital can support that. So how many web, how much website traffic do we need? Is the website they have now converting into leads in a CRM? Uh, and being a HubSpot agency, we're very much CRM focused. So having the CRM marketing tools, sales tools, customer service and support tools, everything in one place so we can run reports on what's working and what isn't working. Um, we like that whole transparent thing where a client can have their own dashboard and be seeing um, exactly what's happening. So how much traffic's coming in, how many of those people are being converted into leads in their database or the CRM, how many are being nurtured into customers, uh, how many are being handed over to the sales team. A lot of the work we do is to the marketing end. So we generate, do the lead generation piece, and then at a certain stage, that lead gets uh, handed over to sales um, and they then take that. Uh, and obviously, we expect them to convert that lead because we know they're an engaged lead. They're not just any cold lead. These are leads that we've nurtured already and have a relationship with. Uh, so that's a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today is based out of not theory, it's what we've seen working with clients. It's what we've really focused on with clients over the past, certainly the past five years, but I think the past year has been really seen this acceleration in digital everyone's realized we can't rely on trade shows anymore we can't rely on face to face a lot of the time uh, and digital is far more scalable and effective uh, obviously esther you work in the industry mm -hmm. krishna will talk a bit about your business as well i've been looking at your website and things so just i'd like to hear a bit about you, you your two's business and what you're trying to achieve as well um, and then just finishing off with me it's just 
Ignite Growth was set up with my wife and myself a couple of years ago, really on the back of businesses asking me personally to go in and help them with this strategy piece. And so I did sort of a, a daily consultancy rate initially uh, and then sort of was asked to be a non-exec director on a couple of boards as well um, to make sure that the execution happened the same way every uh, right throughout um, what we'd said we were going to do was actually happening. So, so my goals really are to help you clearly define business growth goals. I think that's the heart, nearly every business I go and talk to. Some have, I wanna make a million pound next year. The majority say we just wanna grow. Others are sort of struggling or going backwards and want to reverse that decline. And so everybody I think needs to start with these goals and really clearly define them. So we get very specific with pounds how many pounds do you want to generate next in the next 12 months in the next five years where do you want to be um, and then as I say we reverse engineer that so we'll start with business growth goals and um, we'll then look at your growth goals breaking those down into specific metrics to measure because again I, I'm, I'm I want data to be telling me what's happening with my business I don't really want opinions around the around the table I'd rather have the data black and white data we all have opinions, don't we, Esther? I see you smiling, but it's uh, it's one of the things we have in Lincolnshire a hell of a lot with businesses. I don't know what it's like in Yorkshire, but you have a founder who's very, very um, got really strong opinions on what needs to happen with his business. And actually, when you look at the data in black and white, you say, well, actually, this is what's happening. Yep. So, so getting back to that, you know, having a metric and a KPI that we're measuring is really key for everything we do with clients um, and setting up a system that can measure that for them is often the starting point so they'll have a 12 dashboard reports uh, of 12 reports from start to finish end to end of what's happening with the business um then mapping out the 12 elements that we work on in a growth strategy for people so i'll share how we do that uh, how we sort of get them uh, and we do a 40 page document as a growth strategy that's generally how we start with a client is we'll we'll map it out they may have a marketing strategy they may have some sort of sales process in place and we will really analyze every element of what they're doing in their business to make sure that when we start feeding the leads and the traffic in it goes through a set conversion process that we're measuring and um, because i think conversion is everything for us you know if we know we're conversing at 25 percent, how do we then get it up to 30 percent to 40 percent things like that so measuring that and mapping it out is important we're very biocentric, so we're trying to get businesses again, everyone we speak to, we try and get them away from talking about themselves and broadcasting about themselves and thinking about those customers, understanding who that customer is they're appealing to. Now, you know, if you're a B2C, is Krishna, is your business very B2C? Sorry, you're on mute. Can you just... Uh... Can I take you off? Sorry, no, I was doing it in the wrong place. Um... It, yes, at the moment, B to B to C, we are just looking at B to B at the moment. But uh, and I'm is trying that to going do it more down the retail route through the supermarkets and things? Or? No, not supermarkets, not yet. If I don't have to, we were looking at delis, um, but it's about pricing um, there. Um, so there's a there's another route that um, we're exploring, um, and then and that's online actually. That's more with an online retailer. So it's, it, yeah, it's yeah. happened because of COVID, but yeah. Yeah, and I think that there has been a lot of change in the last year, certainly in your area, you know, in food. Um, how's the e-commerce work for you? Is that going well or? Uh, yeah, it it works really well, but I need the rest of my marketing to... To support to it. it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's excellent because that's what we will cover today. And a lot, I mean, I speak to quite a few businesses who, who have an e-commerce element and it's, I mean, a lot have grown by 150, 200% the actual e-commerce sales. Um, just just organically without any real strategy behind them because the demand is there now so it's it's as we start coming coming through uh, coming out of lockdown how do we maintain that that sort of level um so again and esther you're very you're very business to business i take it with your services you like us quite service orientated um, well we say business yeah business to business well it's a nice mix of both really so you've got the corporates, the established businesses that we come in and talk to regarding, you know, custom software yeah. requirements. But then we also have the not consumers as such, but they're startups or entrepreneurs. So yeah, yeah. they kind of fall within that kind of 
was our grey area, but yeah, most most of the time we're talking. And do you segment those two? Do you have a different approach to each of those industries, or do you sort of lump it all together in your mind? We'll lump it all together at the moment. Um, I mean, as we talk, you'll probably yeah. get to know a little bit about what we do. But we've just been acquired by our biggest dog, our biggest client. Right. And that has completely thrown a spanner in the works because they were our ideal customer profile, they were our persona, and now that revenue stream has gone because yeah. they now own us. So I'm in a position at the moment to redefine our business strategy, redesign our customer profile. So at the moment, everything is on the table to be changed. Wow. And you're in charge of sales, the sales side of it, or yes. are, you, are you marketing and sales? No, so I'm the head of sales. Um, yeah. We've got a head of marketing who's come over from Elder Studios. Got She's you. doing a great job kind of getting the basics Good. established. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's my job to kind of look at the Good Fit buyers and the yeah. profile and that kind of stuff. So we are working together. And if this is recorded, I'll just definitely share it with her. Yeah, yeah, you'll get a recording of this. And um, I'll also send you a, a link to it. We, we released a, a six video sort of masterclass in, in January. I think you'll find that interesting as well. Okay. Well, both of you probably will. So I'll, uh, I'll give you a link at the end to that. Remind me to do that. And I'll give you a link to that. Um, yeah, so mapping out the elements, getting this buyer centric model and um, targeting good fit buyers is, is, as you've just said, it, it's key to me that we're not wasting time with people who are never going to become a customer, that we have a real process of lead generation that's qualifying people but we're only targeting the right people anyway. We understand who they are, you know, and in B2C, that's very much a segment of, of the general public that you'll be targeting, Krishna. You know, you'll have from all your customers that have bought off you, I can guarantee now we'd be able to define where the majority of your profits come from. And it'll be a certain type of person, you know, what drives them, what's their, what's their pain points, why do they like to purchase your curry paste versus the competition, you know, and that depth will go through how we sort of, understand that a bit more in this session as well um, and then we do a lot of customer profiling where we're mapping out this profile of you know what are their sources of information they go to online what blogs what social media platforms do they use you know really we really dig into our primary buyer personas uh, and we have we have five in our company we have five different ones but I always know there's one entrepreneur business owner of a certain size company who's our best fit you know so again while we will share content with other people we will engage with them we'll share videos we'll you know have they'll download guides they'll read our blog posts a lot of that engagement that we can see i'm always looking for that sort of buyer who i know is looking to build build the business you know so um so again i'll go through how we do that and how we get data back on what they're engaging with content wise to really decide they're a good fit buyer we need to pursue them and we don't need to spend too much time over there and again, in sales, Esther, that to me is how modern sales teams work. Um, you know, uh, me as a marketer, I should be giving and supporting its sales enablement is what they call it. I should be enabling sales to sell at a higher velocity. And the only way they can do that is if they spend all the time on the phone or meeting good fit buyers. Um, you know, by working harder and working smarter, as they always used to say, I just think it's a load of rubbish, really, because <laughs> you just end up being busier and busier and on the phone and wasting more time. So, so <laughs> yeah. to me, it's very much how do we identify those good fit buyers and then how do we nurture those relationships? Um, and some of our good fit buyers will be using the competitors at the moment. And it's just a matter of getting awareness in front of them. So when they want to move or try something different, we're perfectly positioned to take advantage of that. So. That's what I'll try and cover in the next two hours. Um, I will keep it to two hours if I can, um, as I say. And with two, with only three of us involved in this, you've got plenty of time to ask questions as well within this. So, um, so just, uh, I think you've both done this, but let's just do it again. Krishna, if you just come off mute and just tell me a bit about the company name, you know, some of the background in how you set up uh, Dilishik, I, I see it as at the moment, um, you know, what your goals were when you set it up and what your growth goals are going forward. You know, what do you want to do in the next year, the next 12 months, uh, the next five years? Um, and what are the challenges you you can see in your industry that you need to overcome? Um, so um, the com we've got it's Dilish Curry Paste um, yeah. and we're five and a half years old and um, it was set it's it was uh, I was working when we first set it up so it was a part-time you know it was part-time um, was that about 2015 you say yeah yeah 
Um, and it's just been um, growing steadily, really. You know, I haven't worked on it full time yet. Um, when you're asking about this, the sectors, um, we just, I suppose at the moment, just the, looking at the other two questions, at the moment, it's just been a case of starting the, this program with um, through the, the LEP and, and, and Kirklees. And yeah. just starting again, you know, looking yeah. at everything that we've we've got. And so at the moment, I can't answer those questions because I'm in that right. period where I'm just I'm just and that's that's a purpose of being on these calls. So yeah, um, yeah. I could make I could make rough things up, but it it only come it only throw me because I've I've, I've decided to go back to the beginning and, and really. So what's your best everything. year you've had so far in that five years? What turnovers your best turnover you've achieved? Um not quite sure actually um i'd have to go back and have a look yeah and where do you want to take it then have you got any uh what's in your mind of the next year what do you want to see um i want to it's more um about the i suppose the activity and, and the focus that i put in the business at the moment um because i appreciate i can set the goals it's just about making sure i've got the right skill set yeah, yeah. Um, of moving of moving forward mm -hmm. but I think you need you need a goal to be aiming at so you can start as I say reverse engineering how many customers that equates to and you know and what sectors you're going to target it's just so you're because you're, you're very right you know you, you're gonna you can have a lot of activity that will produce nothing as far as revenue growth goes um, and it's just defining those goals so you build your strategically you're building your activity and your execution around the things that will make a difference to your bottom yeah. line yeah yeah um, because oh, I don't know what Esther feels like that, but I feel a lot of people do things on digital just because they think that's what they've got to do you know it's the same with social media they try and cover every channel rather than focusing on the channel that is really going to give them leads and customers so again, I think you need to think this through over the next few hours and try and come up with a figure you're going to aim for. Um, it doesn't have to be overly ambitious. It can just be a figure. But I think, you know, hitting that figure or getting near that figure will give you something to really channel what activity you do do. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, rather than being really busy and then thinking at the end of next year, well, we're still where we were this time last year. You know, you want to set some real clear goals that this is what we're going to achieve this year. You know, and it may be just to get the e-commerce to a level and, you know, we want this level of e-commerce business coming in, but we also want to get into the B2B sector more in these sectors and uh, and then that'll help you define what work you do to do that. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Esther, go on then, just uh, far away. Obviously, um, I know your Elder Studios has been bought out now. And, uh, yes. So back in December, we were bought out. Yeah. Um, by Daisy Group, big telecoms business up here. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and we've, we're in a position now to rebrand. So by April the first, their new financial year, we are going to be a new agency. So our name is to be Affinity Code. Um, sector that we're working in is um, custom software development and kind of dis digital and business transformation. Um, yeah. My growth goals, it was a funny year for me last year because I only joined Elder Studios in January last year with a view of coming in to um, set up a sales team, didn't have a sales team, push out professional services, get more customers. And then lockdown hit after three months. <laughs> yeah, lockdown hit, which made it quite difficult. And also we were launching a product as well. So the previous managing director wanted to move from a service-based business into a product-based business, just so there was a bit more yeah. kind of reoccurring revenue. Yeah. We launched this product and my sales efforts moved away from professional services into pushing this product out, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, so for nine months, all I did was sell products sell products and have yeah. ignored the professional services now that product has gone with the old managing director and now we are back into the professional services world only so it's trying to fit for me my growth goals are is to get professional services deals and big so, ones so professional services deals in a corporate setting so you want to be aiming what size company would you say then's your um, ideal have you sort of done again, any work on no, I'm trying to do my buyer persona and my ideal customer profile at the moment, but I'm yeah. finding that based on 
the customers that we had before, because we, we didn't just have all our eggs in one basket, there isn't any kind of commonalities between them. Yeah, there's no 80-20 um, rule. No, and it's, I don't know where that snort came from, sorry. Um, yeah, so it's quite difficult. So I'm just trying at the moment to kind of look at what the competition's doing, seeing what their kind of market size looks like. They've got to have money. That's, yeah. you know, custom software development is expensive. Yeah. So they've got to have money. They've got to have a fairly decent turnover and they've got to be quite innovative as a as a business anyway. Yeah. Because you're not so going to there's either, there's, Well, there's obviously there's financial services is a, is a sector I can think of off the top of my yeah. head who, would, um, who have money think, and are constantly innovating. We're thinking anything that's heavily regulated. Yeah. If they're regulated and they yeah. don't do something, then obviously there's got to be consequence. So we are thinking finance, legal. Um, Fire and security. I hadn't thought of fire and security until this morning, believe it or not, because someone posted something about um, yeah. digital boards instead of the, the, the signs that you get yeah. on the door. So, yeah, so anything heavily regulated, basically. Um, and manufacturing seems to be one that our growth managers seem to be banging on about a lot at the moment because they're going yeah. into lean manufacturing. I just don't think they've got the money. But now, engineering to... and manufacturing is a hard one. The good side is they have a high a high um a high product value usually that mm. when they're selling some of their kit it's uh, you know you think about uh, we've got um siemens in lincoln here and they you know their machinery is the starting point is about 250 grand for a piece of kit so yeah they yeah. have that and so they do have the money but they also are quite a traditional industry that have always relied on trade shows for years um, and yeah. so i think the last year has shifted their mindset a lot yeah, uh, I've seen a, a bit a real shift in mindset that they yeah. realise we're not going to have big trade shows around the world. So um, I think it is a good sector. It's just going to be they are going to digitally transform. They have to. It's yeah. just how how quickly they're going to do it. And yeah, there's that's... a lot of embedded management in there that are old boys who've been in engineering all their lives. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, I've been speaking to a specialist up in the northeast who. Um, He's a consultant for manufacturers and he said, you know, we're all grumpy engineers. And he was like, you don't want some technology person coming in and bombard, you know, bamboozling us with jargon and stuff. So I was like, well, you partner with me, you go and talk to them and see what opportunities you can hmm. arise where tech is the thing. So that's kind of what I want to. Put yeah, into I think that's strategic plan. You've hit it on the head there. I think a, a good sector would be electrical engineering because mm. they, they're, they're very innovative. They're coming up with new products all the time. Um, yeah. but they're, they're really poor marketers and they're not, they're not good at, at that side. Because <laughs> so, yeah. uh, na naturally, by essence, most of the companies have been set up by very bright people who are very techie orientated. But uh, yeah. so that's worth definitely worth some thought. And I think that'll give you your professional services route and what, uh, what to go down. So we'll cover some of that today as well. Um, a lot of that I go into in quite depth here. So, Brilliant. okay. Right. Um, and this is, a, I don't know if any of you read Daniel Priestley's books, but he's an, uh, he's an Australian entrepreneur who I really, really like. I've read all his books and I've met him down in London a couple of times as well. Um, and he's, he's one of those guys who, who just, he can, he can see this whole digital revolution we're going through. And he's, he's very much sharing how smaller businesses can really embrace it. Um, and his, his whole mentality is that we're going through a time now where there's a greater potential for growth than we've ever had for businesses. And I really buy into that. Um, and people get scared by it and overwhelmed because there's a lot to take on. But actually, if you do it step by step and always align it with revenue, uh, I think that digital and social can really help you grow. So um, I, I sort of always share that uh, in there. Um, and, and we've all got different, and being a HubSpot agency, we get shared a lot of data. Uh, they have over 100,000 users around the world now of their software. So they share their, with us as partners, they share a lot of data from, from their database. Um, and, and there's always different drivers, I think, for people's business growth. It's either I want more website traffic, uh, I want better lead conversion, I'm getting some leads in, but we don't seem to convert them well into customers. Again, that's going into sales, I think, more of a nurture process and a sales um, problem they have higher volume of leads so yeah we're getting traffic but it's not converting to leads a better quality of lead you know higher customer retention so we get customers but they don't seem to stay with us long uh, and that all should lead to increasing revenue so i always try and think to myself right let's write down what's business growth look like for that business so for esther she's at a different place to krishna you you're both at different stages you both want to grow the business 
but you know it's very very different what your drivers are at the moment um and uh, you know when this is some of the hubspot research we get shared um everything is around converting contacts and leads into customers now um, i think we all know that we can generate traffic to our website i mean there's enough ways to get traffic to your website and i always say you know people telling me they've got a web a traffic problem i say you know traffic isn't a problem it really isn't. I can set up paid ads. I can have organic traffic. We can have social traffic. Uh, we can have custom audiences. We can pixel people. There's lots of ways to get traffic through. It's actually converting that traffic into a lead in your database and then nurturing them to customers. That's a real problem uh, that most people face. Uh, and when you look at their website, you can see why it's just not set up to do that. Um, so they want to spend more and more money at the front end driving traffic there. But I say you, it's actually just falling on stony ground. You're not haven't got a conversionally optimized website to really turn that traffic into leads and identify who the visitor is and how you can help them. So we'll cover a lot of that. So growing traffic to the website, converting leads, you know, all of this is, is really a marketing problem. Um, and then sales enablement is supporting the sales team to, to convert that traffic and those leads into business revenue and customers for the business. So we'll start with knowing our growth numbers. Um, and I, I start with website traffic. Do you, do you both have analytics on your websites? Krishna, you do? Yeah, you're nodding, you're both nodding. So, yep. and I start with that because I want to know what the current situation is before we do any work with any client. I want to know where are they now? Because most people have enough traffic and uh, you know they think they don't. And it's usually down to, we're not getting enough leads and customers, but actually they do have enough traffic. They just haven't converted it. And my, my, some rule of thumb is you should be looking to convert 2% of your website traffic. If you're not converting at 2%, you're not doing a very good job. Uh, you know, most people I speak to are 0.1% of their traffic is actually converting ever into a lead or some sort of contact. So that is my starting point. So in this situation here, this is, um, as I blanked out, I don't think there's any, this, is, this was the client's website we started working on with them. And we, when we looked at it, we said, well, you're actually getting 2,200 visitors to that website every single month. You know, that's, that's good traffic. You know, now if we were conversing that at 2%, you'd have more than enough leads to achieve your growth goals without anything else. So have a look at your analytics and see where you are at the moment is a great starting point for this. So how many leads are you currently generating? So you know what traffic you've got. So how many leads are you currently generating? And I would focus on digital leads for this, uh, for this process. Yes, there'll be other sources of leads that come into your business. People will pick the phone up to you, things like that. You know, there's ways of monitoring that, but we're talking digital here. I want this to be really digitally, digital first, and then other forms of traffic that you can actually come into the mix of your strategy and say, yeah, well, we still generate from networking or people seeing our adverts and picking the phone up, there'll be offline routes that will always produce your traffic. Um, but this is traffic you can control and measure, you know, an advert in the newspaper, all of these different things. I, I always think, well, how are you going to measure a return on that? You know, my, I want to know what return on the investment I've spent. Like I had an uh, one of our clients at the moment is an, um, an architect and they put an advert in the, uh, in the Saturday times last weekend in the property section. Um, so, then they rang me in the week before the advert was going in, hadn't told me this and said, oh, can you set up HubSpot to measure people coming through the website? So in the end, we, we did. And they got uh, they got four leads from London uh, for work from that advert. But I said, you know, that should have all been set up before you paid the money for that advert um, because you want to measure exactly what response you got from it. Uh, what sources are providing your leads? So in a digital sense, are you getting them from organic search? Are people searching you on Google, coming through the search engines organically, finding you? Or is it paid? Have you got some paid campaigns running that are driving um, paid organic, uh, paid campaigns on the search engines, such as through Google AdWords? Uh, you maybe run some YouTube ads. Um, Certainly for, for yourself, Krishna, uh, you know, that sort of traffic, awareness traffic on YouTube is so cheap nowadays to generate. Facebook, obviously, do some really good paid ads, very highly targeted as well to your buyer personas. Um, so paid is a great way as long as it's managed properly and you're measuring your return on that pay. Uh, so I've paid this much out this month, but it's generated as this amount of revenue. Social media, again, you can generate a lot of organic traffic on social media just by day-to-day 
posting and just organic posting and having a really tight posting schedule where you're mixing up your content mix so it makes it a really interesting channel that people want to engage with and it's where instagram's come in a lot lately as well uh, and then your offline sources so really understanding where those leads are coming from how many leads are we generating a month and where are they coming from and then focusing on the digital areas to really accelerate your lead generation from there um, and what type of leads converting for you? Is it an inbound lead that comes through your website? Is it the e-commerce side that converts for you? Is it you targeting people? So again, Esther, is it you saying, yeah, I know this sector, electrical engineers, say for instance, is the sector and we're going to target an outreach to these companies within that sector. And these are the people within those companies we need to be in front of. Uh, so again, that's very much targeted. That's an outreach mentality. Uh, or is it referrals? Are your customers a great source of business for you? Are your leads, your best leads, which they should be, are people referring other business to you because they're happy customers of yours and you've got a process in place that rewards them for referring other people to you. So again, these are areas that I look at when I look at the type of leads that are coming in. Where are they coming from? How many of them? What's the lead source? But also which are the ones that are converting? Um, and then your digital leads, you know, where, how many are coming through your website? How many are coming through e-commerce? You know, what's your digital generation of leads versus your offline? Um, and then the quality of lead, have you got a criteria in place? And we, we always insist on it when we're doing the marketing for anyone because we want to know when we hand a lead over to sales, it's met this criteria. So if they haven't got a criteria and they're just classing every lead as equal. I mean, with you, Esther, you'd have someone who's gone to your website and filled in a form and maybe engaged with you, or you'd have someone saying, holding the hand up and saying, can I have a trial? You know, can you give me a, you know, can you actually have a meeting about developing a product? You know, they're very different leads, but yeah. in the old way, we'd have classed them all as leads, you know, but yeah. um, I think the hand raiser to me is going to close three times quicker than the person who's still in the early stages of looking at things. That's, this is a big thing for me. Um, I mean, I've come from a background of lead generation, so I, I, I did 11 years of out, called outbound oh. for customers. I loved, I loved it. Yeah, absolutely yeah. loved it. I'm nutter. Um, but yeah, I what I struggle with is the quality of the leads that come through from our website because there's no way to actually set that criteria. Are you yeah. a tire kicker with a great idea but no money, or are you actually someone who's thought thought yeah. it through and you're ready to talk? So that's what I need to work on that yeah. criteria of what a lead. And that, that is where you need to know the more engaged people because you can look at what they've consumed content-wise and you can make very good contextual decisions before you ever speak to them. Yeah. You know, someone who's researching and downloading a guide on developing an app, say I'd have a top of the funnel guide saying how to develop your first app, which is clearly aimed at people who are the lower end of the market, they're developing yeah. the first app. But then I'd have a checklist as the middle of the funnel work. And I would also have a checklist to complement that guide. I'd have blog posts around that. And then I would be lead scoring those leads and saying, look at this guy. He's read 10 blog posts. He's downloaded the checklist. He's clearly reading the, um, the guide. And again, in HubSpot, you can upload your, gut, your PDFs into their documents and it will tell you when someone's opening it and reading it. Okay. So. So again, we do our lead scoring off that. This guy's opened the guide five times over the last two days and he's clearly engaging with it. And then we pick the phone up and say, oh, see you reading our guide on inbound marketing. You know, seeing you've been looking at some blog posts, um, you know, is marketing the problem? Are you trying to generate more leads? And we just get the conversation going very naturally then. I don't think we've got any lead scoring capabilities actually within what, what she's using and what she's set up. So that's what good. CRM she use? Oh, we're using the most awful CRM in the world. It, it, I think we've got to be moving over to Dynamics once we're settling with the acquisition. Um, yeah. We're using something called Capsule at the moment, which is literally... Oh, that, yeah, I've not yeah. heard of it, so that's always worrying when I haven't heard of it. Yeah, I think I think she's talking about a HubSpot. Yeah. Um, I'd look at it. Maybe. As I say, I'm, I'm not... Even though we're a partner, I always say there's other things out there, but it's yeah. the fact that everything's in one place with HubSpot. That's what sold it to me, and we used it for six months as a company before we ever became a partner right okay and to me it was that end-to-end -end reporting i could get on everything happening that's what um, i need that's what i need to say i like facts and figures and black and white and yeah. know what i'm doing so yeah it is and uh, and those data-driven decisions are so important because as yeah. i say everyone has opinions in every company and that's the problem i think in meetings i'll say well what's what's the figures tell us first you know because the market never lies to you and that's always what i 
I liked about, I think it was Daniel Priest who always said, the market will never lie to you. You know, your yeah. black and white figures won't lie to you, whereas you'll often convince yourself of things that are working and aren't working. But actually, he says, let the, let the data tell you what's working. Yeah, and you can't absolutely. go far wrong because then you can optimise it and say that's worked better or that's worked less. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah, I think that's key for you to get the right system at the heart of your business first and then yeah. build everything else around it. Um, yeah. And if it's a CRM that's crap to use, no one uses it. And the, pro the point of a CRM is that all the data goes into one place. So yeah, if exactly. you speak to a client or marketing speak to a client or customer service speak to a client, everything's there. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, there's only myself in sales. Um, yeah. There's only one marketer and there's mm. the rest of project managers and developers and they've got their own technology. So it hasn't been an issue at the moment, but it's... No it'll be an issue once we grow and develop so but you, your argument's got to be esther that we need to build a system that i plug salespeople into yeah. not that not employ a good salesperson you want to have a sales process and a system where you say this is how we do it here exactly and these are the metrics you're being judged on you know because yeah. you're helping people succeed yeah. you know, it's like me i always think i'm helping business owners succeed or i'm helping a market to succeed in their boss's eyes you know and i think if i can help them succeed we should have a good relationship all the time yeah absolutely. but it's the same when you bring a sales team on you know it's all down to how many times they're making calls in a day how much activity they have you know and with hubspot we have activity how many emails have been sent out how many calls by salesperson and um, so you can see if you've been in sales all your life you know that activity is what gets your leads not oh yes yeah, yeah absolutely but, but if you can also give them a system that marketing supporting that sales activity and say, look, this person's engaged with this blog post, he's downloaded this guide and they look in the CRM and say, oh, God, look how engaged these people are compared to him yeah. who's visited the website once and then never come back. Same with e-commerce, Krishna. You can see I would segment e-commerce people into people who've bought three times or more off you and have just a customer list of those. And I would work so hard on those people because that's where your referrals come from. They already know you and like you, and that's where your profit comes from. I was thinking e-commerce, you never make money on the first sale. It's those second, third, and fourths that you make the money on. Um, because you, the cost of customer acquisition's already been embedded, you know, you've already acquired them. So, um, so again, having HubSpot and saying, right, I want from my, what, uh, e-commerce system do you use woocommerce or shopify or anything woocommerce yeah yeah and again yeah hubspot, WooCommerce. Has, yeah, hubspot has a built-in integration with woocommerce that's two-way so it'll pull people out of woocommerce into hubspot and backwards as well so um so it's a really easy way to segment and set an active list up over people of people who've purchased off to you a number of times um and then dig like hell into those people say you know what's what's the buyer persona in there what's what's our common denominator that we have in there um, and it might be very geographical is it is it very yorkshire based or are you national are you are you getting sales all over the place or um local? early on we did get quite a lot from down south um however yeah mainly um yorkshire but sometimes it's just you, you know it, it can be random if somebody's just found you yeah. which surprises me because I don't actually do a lot of marketing. So it's quite nice when somebody does find yeah. find you and try you when you haven't done anything. Um, but then there's um, mainly from recommendations, like like you've said, really, you know, somebody's yeah. recommended you. And a lot is from, uh, especially the other day, somebody, had, a brand new customer um, asked me quite a lot of questions and then tried the tried the product and then said they loved it and they've mentioned me in a, in a group um, yeah. with lots of followers so it's things like that that you don't necessarily track so easily unless they've, they've told you yeah um, yeah and I think, uh, you know th there are some real curry aficionados aren't there that just will yeah. will talk like mad if they find a product they love so you know you, you're very much nurturing that influencer mentality there get people to speak in groups like that you know yes. it's, it's happened by serendipity so far without your marketing so if you actually put yes. the marketing effort behind this exactly you know you can but i would have very targeted marketing to generate those conversations yes um, so yeah so that's good good to hear and it's good you're using woocommerce because i think uh some of the integrations you can get with platforms like hubspot now from woocommerce are so you get so much data out of that that um you know it can really help your understanding of how you're going to grow you know not just what's happened in the in past and the historical data but it's that we can use this data now to grow and yeah. um, so that's fabulous. Um, 
And then looking at sales figures. So again, this is in your street, Esther. Uh, what's the current annual revenue? How long's your current sales cycle? So if, you know, with with uh, Krishna on e-commerce, she knows it's more or less an instant decision. Is this? They come on if they like the product, they'll buy. Whereas a lot of our professional services clients, this could be a six month from you getting in touch with a lead to actually revenue and deals being signed. So you need to know that when you're planning your strategy, because there's no point saying we're going to generate a million in the next year. If you know that it's taking six months before the first client hits. So you've got to be realistic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and knowing that that sales cycle time is really important. And again, it's, um, it's, you know, you can, you can minimize that by having good engagement with content, valuable insights being shared. You can make that, that shrink from six months to four months you know you can really understand the questions people are asking you and I always say to sales teams you know just get in the mentality of writing down every question you hear because that can become a piece of content that marketing produces for you you know and that mentality of constantly going through the talking to the sales team and we do it a lot with companies where we go in and we just have a meeting and say right give me 80 questions you get asked and they're laughing at you and then by the time you've finished you've got 90 odd on a board somewhere that you've written down and then we say right when when are people asking you that oh that's at the first meeting what about the second follow-up meeting and then you know when we start breaking it down like that and saying right so we need this content to preempt those questions in your first meetings as you get into a second meeting you need this type of content uh, and that's how we build content strategies out with them but it's very sales enablement driven it's so the sales team have it there um, and we know other people will be asking those questions out there so if you become the authority and the resource they go to to answer those questions you get in those initial, you know, so for Esther, it'll be, how do I develop my first app? Having lots of blog posts on that, things to think about, you know, mm -hmm. you, a lot of coding is very technical to us as, as laymen, but if you can put it in very plain speak, um, you know, that's one of the big things a lot of tech companies do. They simplify it because they're focusing on the outcome at the end all the time. You know, this is the challenge you may have, and it may be really you know, it may overwhelm you to develop an app, but actually these are the steps to follow, you know? So there's lots of content out there. If you research it, you can see it and you just do your own version of it. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, yeah. But every now and then you'll hit a question that lots of people are researching and you can get that going. Um, same with curry paste, you know, the curry paste is the base, base thing of lots of dishes. So let's start having, talking about the dishes as well, the end product, as well as what they're gonna use the paste for. Um, but you know is yours vegan is it a vegan paste yeah so again do you make a lot of that yeah. I don't see a lot on here yeah. about it um on the website when I land on there is there there's not much about the no I, no I, no it needs a lot of work so yeah, yeah. there is there so again is you may have a, cam a campaign uh, aimed at the, the vegan reason market why I wanted to go yeah yeah you see what I mean? It'll, yeah. it, that'll determine what your campaign that you focus on first is. It doesn't mean that's your only campaign. It's just sort of saying, right, we've got a really good vegan product here. Um, and on one of my uh, groups that I'm in a peer to peer group with a, a, a load of other business owners and one of them's a brewery and he doesn't make anything about his beer being vegan. And I said, that's a huge miss. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a massive opportunity there. Um, so again, just think of, think of things like that. Um, Think of your end dishes, you know, think of, you know, that that's where in your field, I think you should use something like Instagram because it's so visual. Um, Facebook and Instagram could generate a lot of business to your shop. Um, so again, just thinking of it like that, even doing videos of you, of you cooking, setting up a camera and just doing some videos, things like that on YouTube, you know, all these things are, are so great as, uh, as lead generation. Um, and I would then set custom audiences up, you see, on YouTube of everyone who's watched a video for two minutes or more. Um, and that's how I would start advertising to that audience. I wouldn't be going after everyone generally. I'd say, well, if they've shown an interest here in videos, same on Facebook, you can do exactly the same on Facebook. Uh, you can set up a custom audience um, and just advertise to that audience. So does that make sense? Yeah, so current sales cycle length, how many new customers per month I need to generate? Um, what's my average deal size? Again, that's an important figure because that will determine how many customers I need um, to hit that annual revenue. 
Um, and what's the current lifetime value of a customer? Again, this is so important and you should have that figure and you should be increasing that lifetime value because it means people are being more loyal and spending more with you. So um, again, for that lifetime value, I always think should determine how much you spend getting new customers uh, because you know they stick with you and they order off you four or five times or for you, Esther, they use you for two or three projects rather than just one project then disappear yep. again and you have to start the whole process over finding a new person. So go through your sales figures and really understand those. Um, and then you, once you've got some of these figures in place, you can start looking at ROI in your business um, in, in a very data driven way. I mean, we, we have these figures given to us every year by HubSpot. And we know that a website here, you can see naught to 499 visitors. We should be able to increase that in six months by nine times by following an, uh, the marketing strategies that we're taught and by using HubSpot. After a year, it does drop because you have that initial growth. But then for every website, these are all the size of websites, how many visitors they're getting in their websites. Um, we can see how much increase we should be doing and also what increase in leads we should be seeing as well. Um, then again, lead to customer rates, how we get higher rates. Um, all of this is important data for you because it will help you work forward uh, to what you need to hit. And then that's how we break it down for customers. This is your current situation with your website after a year working with us as a business or embracing some of these uh, strategic views, we should be increasing your company at uh, your website traffic by 1.33 times in the first 12 months, which will give us 3,750 a month visitors. Obviously then that can be broken down into the number of leads that are generated, the number of customers we'd expect. So then it's a very, very data-driven growth conversation we're having with someone. This is what we know will happen if you follow what we do. Uh, so again, getting, as Esther said earlier, getting to that data point is far more important than me selling them on Google Ads or selling them on redoing their website or selling them on something else. I don't want to be a, a tactical agency. I want to be a very strategic agency and then saying these are the things we need to focus on to get it right. Does that make sense? Yep. Any questions? Anything you've thought of, Krishna? No, Esther? Not at the moment. No, cool. And then from that, we can come up with a client, with every client, we come up with a three case scenario um, of what working with us would generate or what following this approach will generate. So a conservative approach is a 20% increase in traffic, which everyone I've ever met should be able to achieve quite comfortably. A 10% increase in leads, generating 80 new clients. And if we know what that 80 new clients is worth as an average order value, we can drive 40,000 in additional income. Being realistic, we'd expect 30% with a 25% increase in leads. Uh, and you can see how the figures increase. Your best case scenario is a 50% increase in traffic, 30% increase in leads. That would give 300 new clients over the year and 150,000 um, of additional income. And that's why we get so specific when we talk to clients, because we want to have these conversations. We don't want to have conversations about tactics. You know, we want to say, where do you want to be? Um, and that's why, Krishna, I know it's difficult at the moment in the early stage, but I want you to get a figure in your mind. So you can say, this is how many leads I need to get to that. This is how many customers I need. This is the split between e-commerce sales and B2B sales that we need. Because B2B is attractive, but it'll be a lower margin, I'd have thought, is it? Um, yeah, it'd be a lower margin for you. So again, you've got to take all this into consideration. Um, and then do yourself three projections, a conservative projection, a realistic projection and a best case. And it's probably worth it for you, Esther, doing this with the new company because yeah. you having this information in front of you will say, right, so if you give me 30% increase in leads next year, I can guarantee we'll have this many customers. Yeah. You know, and, and there may be smaller figures. Every business is going to be different. But I wanted to give you an example of why it's so important to know those figures now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to make you do it over the next 10 minutes. Usually I would do an activity in a live workshop where we'd sit down and we'd go through everybody's, um, these are the eight metrics that I want them to go away with from the workshop. But again, you'll have a copy of the video. I'll also send you a copy of the slides. I'll save this as a PDF and send you both a copy of the slides. Um, 
So number one, what's your financial goal growth over the next 12 months? So that's where you are now and what net new revenue do you want and what's your overall growth goal? So it may be modest. You may say, I just want £100,000 of additional business in the next year, maybe 50000 or you may want to reach a figure. You may want to get to 150000 turnover. Um, where are we now? Well, we're at 50000 now, so we need net new business of 100000 Average order value is a key thing, and it may be in two segments. It may be in a small orders segment, and then there may be the larger corporate work, uh, especially for Esther. She's going back into this professional services side, so you need to know, you know, what's our average order value now? Where do I need it to be? How many customers do we need then to hit those financial goals? How long is your sales cycle I've talked about? What's your conversion rate? So when we get a lead, is it one in five that we convert leads into customers? So again, you need to know that figure so you can improve that because if you improve that conversion rate, you need to generate less leads. Simple as that. If you're one in five and you get it to one in four, then you need to produce less leads you know, than you would have done it to one in five. So that will then tell you how many leads you need to generate in the next 12 months. Um, conversion rate website visitor to lead so again that that website conversion is a key figure for me because I can then work out how I'm going to generate that number of leads that sales need to have to get us to that figure um, and then how many website visitors have you got now and what website visitors do you need so you know those eight figures will give you your end-to-end -end growth um, you should everything else around that will be based on those. So your sales metrics that you work out for your sales team will be based around here, that reducing the sales cycle length and increasing your conversion rate of lead to customer. That is really your two sales figures that you need. Uh, and obviously everything should be then around revenue. Um, at the moment, sales seem to get all the revenue on their shoulders because they, they convert it. But actually, I think it should be just as easy now to say, well, if marketing produced this quality lead, we're hitting our revenue goal. So if we can get a figure next to each type of lead that, that marketing is generating for you and say, well, a hand raiser to me is worth £3,000, but actually a guy visiting the website and downloading the guide's worth 1500 and this guy here who's just visited the website one or it's a cold call from him visiting the website once is 500 you know that to me gives then a, a revenue value next to marketing's activity um, and I think that's the way most companies certainly in America nearly all companies are growing that way now you know everyone has a responsibility around revenue and um, I'm just doing an article at the moment to post on, on revenue operations, which is how the, the Americans align everybody in the service team, marketing, sales, management operations are all aligned around revenue. Um, so they all have a share of that overall revenue goal. So just thinking like that, even in a small business, makes it very different. I think you start doing things for a reason rather than doing things because you think that's what I should be doing. So. So I'll say so when you get the slides, there's the eight questions that I would get a figure next to each of those. Uh, even if it's guesstimates at the moment, Krishna, don't don't beat yourself up about it. Just give yourself something because, you know, it, it'll help everything else. And when you start investing in marketing and things like that, and if you're a small company and you're bringing external people in, you can say, this is what I need you to do for me, rather than saying, oh, what do you do? Um, which is, I don't like people asking what we do. I sort of say, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and then, you know, this is how LinkedIn fits into that. This is how your ads fit into that. So, so let's look at planning out our growth strategy. And this is sort of laying everything out in a mind map type thing. This is how we look at our business. Um, so strategy is all about differentiating us from everybody else in the market in our, the eyes of our customer. Um, so the why, who and what is all the strategic thinking that we do. So we're building out our business goals. You know, the why is really around our goals, which we've talked a lot about. We're breaking then that overall business goal down into marketing and sales goals. We're also, we'll have a vision and a mission for the company. A lot of people, especially in food industry like you're in, will, um, will buy into values and culture. We have a very much an emotional attachment to brands because the values and culture seem to fit ours. Um, visual brand again should be reflected from your values and culture you know i like i like the branding on the uh, on your website the curry paste box and um, behind you i can see it again there you know a lot of that sticks in your mind you know so build around that but build more of an emotional story around that as well um 
And then positioning your positioning statements again for you, Esther, is really important when you're going into industries, having a, an actual statement that you're all behind um, in the business and saying we help electrical engineering companies develop, you know, groundbreaking apps to drive 10 times revenue or two times revenue, you know, being very specific like that rather than we're an app development company, which exactly. then puts you, you know, being very, very, and that's why I think doing the work on the customer is really important, you know, because we, we know Entrepreneur Eddie in our business is a certain size company who's growing to another size. And, you know, we try and talk to him in everything we do, you know, there's the, or her yeah. in everything we do, you know, it's a, it's very much built from our positioning. We help owners of a certain size company get to another size by adopting this strategic approach to drive their marketing plans. Um, so again, having that positioning statement in a, in a business, but also in a, in a B2C business, it's just as important. What's your position as a curry paste? Why are you different? How can you differentiate from the others in the industry and um, the others that are out there that people have a choice um, and then just own that position. So and then that will drive you who that will drive your target markets and your sectors. We've already talked about, you know, identifying the more you can get that ideal customer profile down to sector and companies within that sector, the more you can position your statement in front of the right people. Um, analyzing your existing customers, that existing customer audit is so important because a lot of the answers to these questions are in there. Um, it's just digging deep enough to find them. I know you've said they're not, Esther, but I'm just, uh, as I say, the will, you're going to have to make a, a point of saying at some stage we need to know average order value, segment our customers either by sector or geography, uh, size of company. And there's lots of ways to do that. Um, what's the competitive landscape? So, again, as I've said to you about curry paste, what are the other products out there? You know, understanding what your competitors are doing, but also how are your competitors talking to this person, this buyer persona you've identified? How are they talking to them? What's working for them? You know, we do a lot of not reinventing the wheel. We just say, this is best practice in your industry. This is what they're engaging with people. This is what they hate. You know, and a lot of that's really, really good. Um, do that as well with competitive landscape have a look at your competitors reviews that's a really good tip because we do that a lot look at what people love about them and do more of that and then the one stars and two star reviews see what they hated and really make a lot of that you know we don't do this um you know and i think that's a good tip that um it's something we've started doing a lot more of not just looking at what they do well but also thinking what do they do badly what do people hate um and Esther, I can guarantee it, in coding, it'll be, it's so complex, we don't understand what's going on, so. Where, where, do, you, um, where do you find those kind of reviews? Google, Trustpilot. Trustpilot, yeah. Yeah, Trustpilot, Google. Um, Christian will be able to get loads of information off Facebook and reviews, Facebook reviews mm. on there. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, as I say, if you dig into the competitor, there'll be a way that they have reviews on them somewhere. Um, most of your industry will be Trustpilot. I think, uh, you know, um, they, yeah. well, there are, we have Google reviews on there. Um, okay. But we had someone deliberately leave a bad one who we knew was upset because we we told him the truth about his business. Um, and he uh, he set a fake account up and he left a crap review for us. Um, so, <laughs> so if you go on our reviews on Digital Media Edge, you'll see what I did to it. <laughs> Because he was saying he'd come on one of these workshops and he hadn't, we knew he hadn't because we did run most of our workshops were run through, um, run through uh, what you call it, uh, Eventbrite. So we, we had a list of everybody who'd ever attended. So, uh, so reviews can be good and bad. So, you know, but I think it can give you a lot of information about your competitors and what they don't, what, what consumers don't like. Um, and I think uh, for Krishna, certainly you want to really play on that. You know, this is why we're different because you're positioning yourself. So. Uh, defining and exist, uh, segmenting your audience. I've talked about that quite a lot, using your CRM to segment your audiences in by geography, by buying habits, you know, by demographics, um, lots of ways you can segment your audience. And then you'll have figures for each of those segments and you'll start to see very quickly where your most profit comes from, where the people really like you. Um, so again, having that in built in from day one or your existing customers is really important. Buying cycle length, again, you're going to have different buying cycle lengths in both of your businesses, but knowing more or less 
this is the average buying cycle from us first having contact with someone to someone buying. Um, and as I say, Krishna's will probably be 20 minutes, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it depends what industry you're in there, but understanding that's important. And then mapping out your buyer personas, we'll go through in a bit, um, some of the elements to think about to understand those buyers. And then what do you offer them? How do you differentiate your product, your service, your solution and your pricing? You know, are you being really transparent with pricing? Are you hiding it? Is it difficult for people to find out your pricing? Um, and I think uh, pricing I always put last because I think if you build value and you get a relationship with people, pricing shouldn't be the first thing they compare you on. I think we all fall back to the cheapest when we don't know anything else you know when we've no other differentiator to make a judgment on we sort of go on oh, well who's the cheapest um so that's really the strategic part of thinking and we think once you get all this right and the work put into this and this will often be a four to six month uh four to six week exercise with us before we even start working on a client's actual physical tactics and um, that will drive your website your marketing your sales your customer service all of that will be driven by your strategy then uh, so how your growth plans actually executed, what reporting you run every month on. So reports are sent back to the management team, how you develop your tech stack and your growth stack. So what technology, what email system, what e-commerce platform, how are you storing your, all your data and your CRM side. All of that's driven. All of that tactical thing is driven by the strategy or it should be driven by the strategy. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Are you sure? It can't be that straightforward. <laughs> I've just got a question. Yeah. We will discuss price maybe in the future, but are you, right, are you as a business transparent on your pricing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when the researching and on yeah, the way. On our, if you go on DME service pages, you'll see exactly what everything costs. Right, okay. Yeah. And we started and we used to always be a retainer based model where we work with companies over a 12 month retainer. Yeah. And then because of lockdown, we actually found that it was better to have a three month trial period for us and for the client. Mm -hmm. So we developed a 90 day lead and revenue generator, which was just an accelerator where we work with a company for three months and do a lot of this work with them and start executing one campaign with them to get them some leads and revenue. And that mm -hmm. 90 day relationship actually led to more retainers at the end of it so we said well for 6k that's what we priced it at six thousand pounds for a three-month relationship and then at the end of that it just naturally you looked at their website you looked at all the elements as we were working with them and my team were digging into things we sort of came up with all the proposals and then we said at the end of this you can either carry on with that campaign because it's generating leads and revenue or we can look to increase again um and that we found we suddenly were nearly everyone we spoke to was coming on a 90 day program and then one in three were converting to a two and a half, three, four grand retainer. So it was, um, and to me, it was because it's a try before you buy, you know, so many people out there would sort of saying sign up for 12 months with us and the companies are thinking, hang on, that's two and a half grand a month. That's, you know, 25, 30 grand I'm spending or committing. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's good that because I've been doing a bit of competitor analysis on some of the the bigger players in the software work, software agency. Yeah. Not one of them, no, I'm lying, one of them out of all of them that I've researched were transparent on their prices. And I was like, oh, that is so refreshing because as a as a client who's building their first app, I've yeah. got no idea how much it's going to cost. No. But they broke it down into prototype, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever. And it was so clear. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. But no one seems to be really that... Um, there's a brilliant book I'm going to recommend to you both called They Ask You Answer. Right. Yeah, and it's, um, it's by Marcus Sheridan, and he goes through why being transparent with pricing is so important in the modern age. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's against a lot of our, especially if you've been in marketing for years like I have, you know, it was, oh, the competitors will find out. But he, he says in here, we all can get so much data now that they'll find out anyway. You know, it says, yeah. it's, he says, but actually the damage you're doing is there's a lot of visitors to your website who go elsewhere to someone who is transparent yeah um, because we're doing all our own research you know 70 percent of our research is done before we even pick the phone up to somebody yeah. you know and he says so in that the top number one question is how much is it going to cost me and that's and what we i think i'll probably digress well i'm just probably taking over but no, that's all right yeah that's one thing that i've 
really struggle with is that you get people through the door you yeah. say you know obviously you, you nurture them you warm you up you don't go straight at this and you say so what budget have you got and they go oh I don't know how much it's going to cost so then you go yeah. through the whole process of quoting workshopping all this and they go can't afford that sorry and you've wasted a week of your life of course you have and that's that's as important as a good fit buyer the good fit buyer who's aware of the pricing already you know and it yeah. doesn't have to be totally accurate but you can give guides you can say you know and a great blog post is how to make sure that you keep cost to a minimum on your first version of your app you know something like that yeah. Brilliant. and then discuss it how to save money you know but you may want more functionality in your app so obviously that's going to cost more and then give guide prices you know a lot of people i've seen are doing it very well in your space are giving a guide of two and a half to three thousand for, for for version one and then it, it goes to this yeah no but right. I think you've got to talk price estimate. And you as a salesperson knows that that lead who comes through has got a budget in their mind and you know what that budget is because they've been reading all your stuff saying it's going to be four or five grand to do. Yeah. You know, it's um, it is why the client, yes, client yesterday I was talking to and they were saying, oh, we've got a marketing budget of 20,000. I says, yeah, but you're looking for a million and a half growth. Don't you think you should be investing 10 to 15% in marketing to get a million and a half growth? So I was having that conversation very openly and yeah. saying, how have you come up with 20 grand when you're looking for that size growth it just doesn't equate and it's the old well we'll put a strap we'll put a marketing uh, budget together and you think well what's it based on you know yeah. and so that's how I have the conversation and I'm very open about it because I don't want them thinking this is only going to cost me a few thousand pounds you know if you're looking for 100k growth then of course 10 20 grand is is more than ample to get you think everything going but when you look, when you're in the millions, you know, there's a lot of work there and a lot of, you know, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of investment has to be put in to get the whole machine going. You know, next year you can probably throttle back to 10% or, but to get momentum and get your competitive advantage, you're trying to get in a marketplace, you've got to have that, you know, that momentum. So yeah, pricing, I, I think you, you've got to be very transparent about it, but also be confident in your pricing that this is why it costs this much. Well, um, that it's having, I mean, it's understanding our, it's understanding our worth. I mean, our day rates are, you know, between 550 and 750 pounds a day. Yeah, yeah. But our guys are so experienced and diverse and they've built some really complex systems. And because of that, maybe we need to figure out what our audience is because, you know, someone who's yeah. just wanting to build a little app can't afford us so it's just like you say getting that persona right yeah and you've got to be ruthless in that because you don't need those leads you know and you can be helpful to those people and say there's other companies out there to get started then when you've done that yeah. one come to us you know yeah. I, I would nurture the relationship but i wouldn't i wouldn't be spending all your time on the phone with those people because you're not no. going to convince them uh, and it's not yeah. going to be a project you're going to all going to enjoy because they're going to feel they've paid too much you're going to feel <laughs> like we've not earned any money out of it yeah like, exactly so yeah. you've got to have that natural um exchange of value with each other um, uh, i i am ruth i am ruthless i don't want to waste my time or their time i'm i'm fine with turning people away because i know quite quickly if they're not the right fit it's ju it's the my bosses that are going oh we need to get leads through the door and you're like you we're panicking there's no need to panic we just no, need to no, be no. right and actually just kind of figure this out first so yeah and that and then you've got to go back and say what's our lead generation strategy you know how is marketing going to provide me with those leads how can we support each other you know how do we all work together you know this marketing mentality the americans talk about where sales and marketing are as one now it's so true because if you don't get decent content and decent leads you don't convert them yeah you know, and um so you've got it i mean we have a marketing meeting in dme we have one a month now where we just what, sit a down and a marketing meeting call it a marketing meeting oh. <laughs> sales and marketing it's <laughs> marketing meetings but they're important because the content we produce is going to enable sales and it's always that you know how can we help sales uh, because you guys are at the at, at the coal face and talking to customers every day so you'll be getting those questions back as i said earlier feed them back to us yeah. let us produce content for that um so that makes sense okay good thank you okay it's a great question though as it is because pricing is something we all avoid but it's actually number one in what everybody's thinking how much is this going to cost me so you know by avoiding it i just don't see any argument now for doing that because you're just losing opportunities all the time that you never even knew you had um i would rather have the opportunity and then then realize it's too expensive than the other way around not have the opportunity because i didn't tell them anything yeah, okay. 
So these are the elements. I said I'd share the 12 elements we um, we go through when we're developing a growth strategy, that 40 page document we do with a client. Uh, growth goals is always the start of it. So an overview of the goals we're trying to achieve. This is what we've set out. These are then broken down into SMART goals. So something that's uh, scalable, um, achievable. I can't remember what SMART means now, but SMART anyway, is, is, there is the air. Uh, that it's those um, measurable, smart, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. That was it. Um, so it's got sort of a time um, for time scales wise. It's got milestones built into it. It's very measurable as a goal. And we do that then for marketing, for sales, uh, for operations, for customer services, um, all attached to the overall goal for the business. Um, the market analysis, we've talked about analyzing competitors, understanding the market in depth. Um, ideal customer profile and primary buyer personas is what we map out then. So the sectors we're targeting and the people within the companies in those sectors um, is very, very much mapped out and constantly maturing as we get more data, we're adding more to our primary buyer personas. So we understand them as well as they understand themselves in some stages. Uh, that will then drive our content strategy because all the content we produce is based on questions, challenges, um, industry things that we see people asking uh, all of these should drive your content strategy it shouldn't be producing any other content other than solution based content initially to answer someone's question or give them examples or share some sort of insight with them um, website conversion optimization and development so then analyzing your website as you develop your strategy saying this is best practice within our industry these are elements we need to do on our website this is how we convert better so what landing pages do you need to send traffic to rather than to your home page um, can you send people straight to a certain product if you're talking about it rather than them going on your home page and hoping you find it in your shop um, so in e-commerce, definitely breaking things down by product into, into areas on your site that you can drive traffic straight to. Um, but again, for you, for app development, for all the different elements you do, you want to know if someone's on app development, I can send them to a relevant page on that, not to our home page. Um, and that's your starting point. And then calls to action within your blog posts, offering guides that pop up, having a chat bot that you can people can engage with. All of these things just increase your conversion rates of your website traffic. Uh, having conversion offers and paths. So again, having a guide you're offering, having video series, having all sorts of things you can offer as a conversion offer. You think, you know, what's that buyer persona really looking for help with and how can I package um, some sort of conversion offer that they'll happily give me their name and email address to, to uh, actually obtain. And some of that will be gated. So some will ask for the name and email address to get access to it. Others you may give away free. Um, and that conversion path is very much having a path you're measuring from someone clicking on a call to action or clicking on an ad through to a landing page, through to a thank you page, uh, through to the next step. So again, you'll have a conversion point at each of that. So that's why I say conversion offers are really key to this because you should have multiple ones throughout your site. Um, pillar content and topic clusters. Again, you've got your content strategy. So what's the main topics you need to talk about? What do you want to be known as an authority for when people search you on Google? Google, now, if you do any searches, you'll see there's always that snippet of the most authoritative text on the question you've just asked. And that's how they're doing SEO. So you need to write a pillar content piece on your website. So for you, on curry pastes, you need to write a 4,000 word page all about different curry pastes, you know, and uh, you really need an in-depth. So you're seen as an authority on that. And that's really important for SEO because then your topic clusters are your blog posts around that. Um, so give me some examples of curry paste. I haven't had a look through this. What, what's the varieties of paste that you do and what are the products? Let me go into your products. So we, um, we, uh, we've said from word go that we our curry paste is versatile yeah um so the just being consistent i didn't want to jump on and start doing curry paste no. uh, randomly because it's not it's not what it's not what we say how we say you can use our product but what we did find in um sorry esther you heard this in the last meeting um, but what i did say <laughs> are you two um, on the same meetings all the time yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> um is that uh, um events we found that people would come up to the stall stop and say oh i love curries yeah, yeah. but i can't i can't eat chili right or i can't eat onion and garlic 
Mm. So we've gone, and, and that fit, fits in well with them. Um, um, you won't probably be able to see it from the website, but our values of yeah. what we care about. And, and, and it's about. No, I think I'm just looking under them. the recipes tab and the way you break that down, there's actually, I would have a, have a, a, a pillar page on curry recipes. But then within that, you would have your different topics as you've done here. You've got vegetarian and vegan, you've got meat, you've got fish, you've got dals and pulses, pastas and rice, eggs, accompaniments. You know, that could all be one long page um, as a guide to it. And then you could have your subtopics under those subtopics you've already got on the site, because under those subtopics, you're also going to have products and links to products. So do you see how I'm thinking? You've got your overall overall what's the business known for which is curry paste um and that's you're gonna you've got to position the business as the go-to place for curry pastes and then you've got to break your content that you're creating into vegetarian and vegan so i'd have blog posts on vegetarian and vegan and different dishes within there different videos embedded in those blog posts um but a lot of that content then is going to be then pointing back to your main page. So that will rank really quickly. Once you start, well, not really quick, it's going to take six to 12 months, but yeah. you'll really be establishing yourself and differentiating, you know, where your expertise comes from. So a lot of your values are knitted into that as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, on our site, you'll see we've got four pillar pages. One's on inbound marketing and then, one of my blog posts is what is inbound marketing. So it points back to the pillar page and then, you know, how do you make up an inbound marketing campaign? And then we've actually got a checklist for your first inbound marketing campaign off that. So again, it's giving people lots of supporting content. So you could easily produce um, actual recipes with an image of it and say, download our free recipe guides to vegetarian and vegan curries. You know, and you'd give them a free little guide. All you've done is do it in Word and then save it as a PDF in Word. And they download that in exchange for their name and email address. Bang, that goes in your CRM as someone who's interested in vegetarian and vegan. So you can then engage with them over email. You can, you see how it works. So, but you'd have a really strong call to action in all your blog posts about vegetarian and vegan products saying, why don't you download our top five recipes for vegan curries? And that for you is how I would develop your content and your downloads, because then everyone who downloads and goes in that list, you have then some automated emails start going out to and nurturing them um, all around that subject and sharing some of your products within that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. As I see, as I look through your site, I can see exactly how I would use a blog and videos on here. It'd be huge for you. And then, as I say, custom orders. On I Facebook. think that's, that's what I needed. That's a challenge because there's so much in here. Yeah, and it's yeah. just it's filtering it out to see what the obvious one is, and and when I when you, if you look at somebody else's, it's so easy to do. When yeah, you look yeah. at your own. There's just yeah. getting all of that out and and streamlining that. So that's been really useful. Thank yeah, so you. do me a favor, just do it on one topic. Write a blog post on vegetarian and vegan, whatever you can think of, and then think what questions do people ask me about vegetarian and vegan when you're out meeting people? What do they ask you? Okay. And I would write a blog post, an overriding blog post on that to start with. And then I would go into, into the other areas because uh, you've got chicken dishes under meat. You've got the burgers. You've got lamb chops. You know. The good thing is you've done a lot of the work already. It's just... Sorry, Esther. What? <laughs> I'm starving. Are you starving? Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> But that I would definitely think of think of your content strategy in that way. What what can I give away for free in videos and and articles and blog posts? And what shall I gate so someone would happily give me their name and email address for that? And then you brand it nicely. You use your what you've got behind you as the front cover, um, you know, and then have the Dillish guides to uh, vegetarian and vegan curries. You know, as simple as that. Our top five recipes. You know, things. That, that just I can see I can see my wife downloading it. I can see me downloading things like that for the meat stuff you know I can just see how people would say oh they're giving me free five five free recipes here 
you know, and that's what Joe Wicks and people do. That's all they do is give you free recipes and then you buy their books. And you know. so, should, should, would you would you say that I would take out off the recipes on the website altogether and have them as gated? No, you can you can give them anywhere. I, I don't think you'd take them off. I just think if you if everything we're all lazy and if everything's packaged in a nice little thing that I can download and print off or it's videos, you know, it's a series of five videos you showing them how to do it, even better. Um, but I would mix the two. I would have some free and then say for more recipes, you just have a little call to action at the end for more recipes here, download this. Because you need teaser content to get people engaging with you, yeah. don't you? So yeah, don't make it all gated because that just upsets everybody. But yeah. I think all gate, gate your most important stuff and say, right, this can be teaser. This can start people's interest, but then I can share 10 more recipes. If you like this, then every blog post you have, your call to action is really obvious at the end. You just have a, if you like this, Here's more blog posts of it and download our free guide here or download our free mini recipe booklet, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Cause I have got a, I've got a recipe book that goes with the, um, the gift box and yeah. that's actually in a Facebook group um, yeah. that people can join once they've purchased. So that then they can ask, just, I just thought it'd be somewhere to ask questions, but I need to do more with that as well. I'm not, Definitely. It's, I mean, if you, you probably find when you enough. audit everything you've got, you've got some of this content already. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just repurposing it in different formats, isn't it? Um, yes. So saying, oh, well, I've got this guide, but could I turn a few of those into little videos and, you know, things like that? Video to me is the most the easiest way for you because you can literally. You say text. that, but I struggle to create video. I'm on. I'm doing a a, a, a small short filmography course, yeah. and um, the only reason I've got as far as I have is because I've got homework deadline. I'm quite good at doing homework, um, so yeah, it's uh, it it. My next piece of homework is actually to do a, a demonstration. <laughs> and don't put edit. yourself under pressure. If written's easier and doing some nice photos of it, and that's your best starting point, use that. You know, as I say, it's just using this content to generate yeah. a lead and saying, right, everything's got to have a purpose here rather than just giving, giving. Because, uh, you know, you just become everyone's best friend and you're giving lots for free, but you're actually not getting any data back. So Yeah, well, that's a problem with being there and it's quite yeah. expensive as well in, yeah. in time and money. But if you build that list up and then occasionally, occasionally, you know, you have a competition you run. I mean, the guy uh, with the beers, you know, he built up, we built a lot of his marketing based on Brewdog because they just do so many good Facebook competitions, things like that, where they give you a case of beer. The winner gets a case of beer. You know, you can do easily do that. I will send you a box of curry paste for the winner. Share your pictures or your videos of you cooking one of our curries, you know, and we'll select one. Um, you know, it doesn't have to cost you a fortune. You don't give everybody it. You just have every every month you have some really good things like competitions running and things. So. But then I'd always get the blog content and all these, as I say, there's so many things people ask about curries. And I think you'd, you know, don't worry about repeating what someone else has done. Just do it your own way and write it your way. So. Okay. So a pillar post is, did you say 4,000 words? Yeah. Well, the way we look at it is a pillar SEO? page is a page of content on your website. That's about four to 5,000 words. Um, and then topic clusters are your smaller blog posts and videos and things like that around it that point back to it, um, which are like subtopics. Um, so you're, you're writing about, uh, your pillar page will be everything. I would do something to everything to do with curry. All you've ever wanted to know about curry. Um, so, so your pillar page actually covers quite a lot, a lot of all your different areas. It doesn't have yeah. to be on on the specific area. No, no, it's it's covering everything you want to be known for. So, right. Um, that's how we do it. You know, we do one on inbound marketing, one on sales enablement, one on inbound sales. And then we're just doing one at the moment on account based marketing, which is a very targeted sector based marketing. Um, so we did everything we could think of about inbound marketing. Like you do everything you can think of about curry. You cover vegetable and vegan, meat, fish. I think you've got all your subtopics in there that you could break it all down to. Um, and then throughout that, you could have little download links coming up to download my guide to this, or if you want to find out more about this. Um, that's how I would do it. Have that pillar content first and then have all your blog posts point into that page. Perfect, thank you. And then that's starting to now drive your social media strategy. So you're sharing some of your recipes, sharing some of your videos, sharing some of your blog posts. You're talking to people through social media. You've got lots of content then to share and publish across social media. 
Um, and again, Facebook and Instagram for you. I'd focus on Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube um, for Esther. Uh, YouTube for you again would be great. So, and then your conversational strategy that you're developing is very much how you engage with people. So, do we engage over email? Do we use Messenger? Do we use live chat? Do we use chat bots? Um, and what's the, so the mix you need to get right for your conversational strategy, how you talk to people and how you actually present to them. So I'd say every site needs a chat bot now, but then don't just have a chat bot that's boring. You've actually got to give it some character and start talking to people um, properly through your chat bot. Um, and then they'll be converted into leads in your CRM. So then your lead nurturing and customer marketing comes in. So how do we nurture leads to become customers? And when they are customers, how do we then put our arms around them and show them we really appreciate their custom and that they are a customer of ours. And um, so they generate referrals, they generate reviews, we get cross sell and upsell opportunities. Um, so they're buying more offers effectively. So customer marketing, I think is just as important if not more than your initial lead generation. And then how do we use marketing and sales automation tools? Um, some like the HubSpot tools that we have um, will automate your social media posting for you. It'll mix it up for you, make it look very organic and natural. It'll also host your landing pages. You can host your website on HubSpot. Every element that happens on, on your site and your lead generation and your sales process, you can have your sales pipeline in there. You can automate sales actions, move people from one stage of your sales process to the next. Um, you can attribute revenue to people. You know, all of this can be automated to allow, allow you to scale a lot easier. And that's what I'm thinking. How do I use a piece of technology to automate things? Um, but I don't want to lose the human touch. I think we've got to always keep that human element in there. Otherwise, it could become too automated. So, But certainly internally, we use a lot of workflows internally through HubSpot for our own internal processes. You know, it might not be an external marketing campaign that's running. It might be an internal thing. So when this person reaches engagement of visiting our website 10 times or engaging with 10 pieces of content on the website then you put them into this list and they become sort of a warmer list um, and then of course metrics and reporting and analytics should be at the heart of this so every element's being reported back on and you're getting data um, out of it so if you can get those 12 elements down onto a piece of paper or into a document uh, where you really have thought through each of those it's going to give you a really I always call it a data-driven growth strategy, but it should be data-driven. It shouldn't. It should be very predictable. Should this? I don't think a lot of it uh, happens by chance. Um, it's quite, you know, quite scientific, and uh, um, but that's what digital gives you, you know. And we've got to embrace that. Does that make sense? Any any more questions, Krishna, Esther? No? Yeah. More about HubSpot, actually. I know it's how it, um, probably very obvious. So if I bought some data, threw it into HubSpot, and then we did like an email marketing campaign, it'd do clicks and opens, and it'd really granular, granularly, sorry. Yeah. I mean, because yeah, the GDPR, they won't, HubSpot won't let you do that now, though. It won't. No. No, it's because uh, the GDPR, they've, the only people that are active in HubSpot are ones that have clicked on a link, answered one of your emails, filled in a form. Yeah, right. you have to get them in HubSpot through a cert, through a way that they're actually... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'd use MailChimp or something like that for that. But I mean, even MailChimp's getting really strict on just broadcasting yeah. out at people. Um, I don't think it's going to give you the results you want either, Esther, that approach anymore, because people just... We just close off to that sort of email. It's bizarre, it's bizarre because we... I mean, last year for the first kind of four months of, of working at Elder, because that's all I that's all I'd known. So I was like, yeah. let's go, let's give it a go. So we had some decent data. We, you know, did a Mailchimp email blast. The clicks and opens and the conversion rate was actually really astounding. It was better than I thought it was going to be. So I don't know if it's shrunk down throughout yeah. COVID. But how much of it turned into work? Did you get a lot of work from it then as well? Yeah. So like, again, when you're saying go go back and have a look at you projections and what happened last year and yeah it was a i don't know if i landed lucky um, everything every lead that i got last year converted into business very quickly with not a lot of nurturing or not a lot of work to be honest yeah. and i don't personally think that that is 
accurate. Be nice if it was. Representative of what really happens, yeah. Yeah, I don't, it was, yeah. I mean, in three months of working in professional services, I got 850 grand through and I'm going, am I basing my, this year's projections on that or was that just a fluke? Yeah. You know, and that uh, two of those opportunities came from cold email outreach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you don't think it's you don't think it's a, a work. I just it. well, I just think once when it's getting harder to get people to open them. I mean, try it if you think it'll work. But I, I just think the way we approach it through LinkedIn and connecting with people on LinkedIn and then getting in conversations with them, being really targeted to their, you know, I just think it's a better way of yeah. long term relationships. Yeah. Um, I just don't want to go and spend loads of money on GDPR compliant data and not got a, not get a nah. decent return from it. Yeah, and HubSpot really, I mean, they really are anti that because they, I think they just want to keep their mail servers very clean as well. So they don't want any right. sort of, um, but they, uh, you know, when we, we, we imported a list of 450 people into HubSpot, um, our main clients, when we moved over mm. uh, out of about a thousand, we did a lot of data cleansing ourselves. Yeah. Um, and then we sent out some re-engagement emails to get them to click on a link and things and they i think we activated about 400 of them so it's not it's not hard to do if you send them something relevant or something interesting it's yeah. just um uh, yeah it's just i don't know I, I just i'm not comfortable with it anymore that it works right. it works as a long-term strategy you might have success like you had as a short-term thing but i don't know yeah. whether long-term I'd rather nurture good quality relationships with people and then slowly, you know, slowly grow that out. But um, right. okay, no, it's it's it's, and it's easy in sales because you get pressure from above, don't you? You get your manager saying, "I want it." I'm so. Pressure on myself, really, because at the moment the old managing directors have gone, so the only three people in any senior position are me, Lydia, a marketing person, yeah. and professional services manager that was there looking after the developers. So where coming at this in a in a very bizarre mindset because we don't have anyone strategic above us i know what yeah. i were doing in sales he knew what he were doing in professional services and yeah. now we're like well what do we do um so you three need to sit down really and get this strategy together written yeah, not, not one of you doing the work i think the three yeah, of you need to what we've done is that we've all we've all been jumping on things like this and taking bits of jobs and then we put coming together to put our strategy document together yeah it just not aligned at the moment you know? so that's that's the problem and like you say when you can't get in the office and sit down next to each other it's really hard yeah um, but anyway yeah i'm sure we'll get there but I, yeah the, the whole buying data thing because that's what i had yeah. success with before was a, a, a suggestion from me but yeah and i just think with reputation management everything you're trying to manage your reputation with people and mm -hmm. uh, you only need one or two people to be upset that you've spammed them like that uh, even if yeah. it's GDPR compliant and uh, I just think the damage it can do um, to me, it's not worth it. I mean, if you've had results, you know, it's, it, it's hard to argue against that. If you think the click through rate was so good, but I, I would just question whether that's a long-term strategy or it was a one-off and you just. Uh, what, do you, what do you think to cold calling? I mean, I'm not a traditional, I'm not a traditional cold caller. I'm not selling windows or PPI, you know, I yeah. know how to get to the people. I know how to, position a message because I researched that client but do you think that um, cold outreach is a viable strategy at the moment? No I, I always think warm outreaches so I'd uh, before I make a call I'd research them on LinkedIn oh, yeah, I'd do 15-20 minutes and I'd, I'd make some very and what I've found works really well is using something like Vidyard if you have a look at Vidyard it allows you to embed a, a video in the email um, okay. so I would go on their website and there'd be a little circle of me in the corner talking about their website and i'd say it's richard from digital media edge just been looking at your website you've done these rates really well i've got two or three areas i could share with you that would really help you you know up your conversion rates uh, and then i might share one idea with them there on the video and say you know if we can talk through the rest so that you see i would connect with them on linkedin um, but I always like and share and comment on some of their posts and then send them a connection request i engage first then i connect with them um, and then I'll, I'll send them sort of a video um, very, very much helping and giving value first. Um, no, don't mention our services at all at that stage. Right. 
Yeah. I might just hold off buying any data then and just carry because all I've been doing for the last kind of four months is just LinkedIn networking. Yeah, yeah. Engaging with posts and stuff. A good way, but look at Vidyard and start doing some video outreach. You'll find it stands out and the open rates are ridiculous. People just want to watch your video. So it's uh, um, a northerner and no one can understand me, which is. <laughs> Yeah. Get that Yorkshire accent flowing. Oh God. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'll give that a whirl. Yeah, do do because that that outreach works well, and it's sort of they they'll then visit your website, and but you're showing an interest in them. You're on their website, so it's very hard for them to actually ignore you. Right. Okay. What people naturally want to know something that they say. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So again, what we we are embracing here is putting the customer at the heart of it, making it very buyer centric, our approach, and then building our marketing sales and service around the customer. So we're doing this customer centric approach rather than us broadcasting about us, um, which just is boring, to be honest, and people just don't engage, especially on social media. Um, so we've got to talk about the buyer, understand that customer. Uh, and it's all driven by this, I call them Generation C, and it's all because everyone's so connected and we're just doing all our own research. We're going on this buyer's journey without ever picking the phone up to anyone else. Um, but we're also less patient. We've got no shorter attention levels. We want immediate answers and responses. Um, and I think that's really why this buyer-centric approach is so powerful now and why the old broadcast and that old buying a list of people and emailing them, it's just broadcasting at people and seeing what sticks. And it, it's, um, you know, it, one, it's not good for the reputation of the company, but two, I just don't think it works as effectively as this approach in the long term. You know, in the short term, you may have some success. I'm not saying you can't. Um, I just, I would weigh up um, whether it's, uh, that is actually a strategy or just a tactic um, to get a result. So, so again, I've, I always use this as an example, but it's when me and my wife bought our, a little mini for, uh, for, our, for our, our family. Um, you know, we went through a three month buying cycle of doing all our own research. Jackie was on, my wife was on Facebook chatting to her friends. What cars do you like? Da, da, da. And we've got a little Renault Clio at the time. We knew it was going back. So we just had this whole process and we, I was doing the man thing and being on YouTube, watching every video I could on cars and just trying to give my input. Um, and then we ended up with a short list of about seven different cars we wanted to test drive. We had this identified them all around Lincoln, went around all the car dealerships, just having the worst experience in our life, to be honest, of, of just rude salesmen and just people not having cars. Even I think we wanted to test drive a T-Rock from VW and uh, some of the guy, one guy from servicing had taken the demo car and gone to Centre Parks with his family in it. So we couldn't even get a test drive. So... <laughs> So we ended up going around these garages, finished up at the bottom of Lincoln and just went to McDonald's for a coffee. And that's where we saw Minnie opposite. And um, Jackie said, oh, I used to have that, having a coffee. And she says, I used to love my Minnie when I was growing up, you know, just a real emotional attachment to it. So we went in, met this guy called Nigel, who was a proper Yorkshireman from Wakefield. So he was he was all right. Uh, working in Lincoln but he, he was just just the nicest person we'd ever met and he was just asking us the right questions you know what you're looking for is it a first car a second car what do you want to do and then he just gave us a 48 hour test drive of a Mini Cooper and just said right go off try it he says I know you'll love it Richard all I'll have to do then is get the price right um so we did have a 48 hour test drive we absolutely adored it just loved this little car so um, I went back on the internet again and thought, right, I'm going to find out all the deals on leases and pricing. I think I got £212 from a company in Manchester. I could get a lease on a Mini Cooper. So I went back to Nigel. He was at £289. Then he looked at the extras with me and said, oh, do we really need British Racing Green? Would you be happy with this cream colour with a, door, a black roof? Because that's a free colour rather than 995 quid. And he got it down to 220 so eight pound difference to stay local and be with a local company but all of that process took us three or four months and all that was digital you know we never picked the phone up a mini and that's what i said to nigel you never once came up in my searches which is the worrying thing for you and um, i'm actively looking for a small car and i said and you never once came up um so uh yeah so we've done a bit of marketing work for sopas mini in lincoln now uh, to help them with that. But, but that was, you know, that was very much what we do when we buy anything now, a service or a product. It doesn't matter if I'm looking for an accountant, if I'm looking for HR services, if I'm looking for an app to be built, you know, I'll be doing all my own research and then I'll make a decision to get in touch with who I choose to get in touch with, not 
who someone's broadcasting at me. So I think, again, because we know this is how most people buy anything nowadays, um, we have to align what we do as a company with how they're going to be searching and researching and finding out. Um, so good fit customers is what we're trying to attract. You know, who are these people who are going through this buyer's journey um, and how do we target them? So a lot of our focus is around this because I just think it really does make my sales team and, and my whole sales process when I'm talking to people, I know that I'm talking to people who are good fits, but they're also going through some sort of sales process. They're also on that journey. You know, if someone, you wouldn't approach someone who's not looking for an app, you know, and that's the danger with cold calling is you're going to waste a lot of time talking to people who aren't even in that mindset yet of, you know, they may be researching early on about doing it, but they're nowhere near buying. This is, um, this is something that I'm trying to do because I, I think that we're quite reactive. So when people come to us, it's because they've done the research, they know what they need to do to make their app, they know what they want to do. And I'm going, we're sat there waiting for people to come through the door, which is fine yeah. when they do. Yeah. But when they don't, I want to think about how we get them thinking yeah. about technology, digital transformation, building an app, that kind of thing. So it's mm. so there is a, there is an element of I need to outreach to educate. But if we do that via social media channels, the videos, the blogs, this and that, then that'll probably help speed it up. One. Yeah, definitely, because the only the people who are engaging with that content are going to be thinking in that in that mindset anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as so those are the two boxes I'm trying to tick. Are they a good fit? As in, this is the criteria that we've set for a good fit person. Um, and are they sales ready? Are they actually ready to make a decision? You know, if they're making a decision in six months time, of course, I've got content I can share with them and help help nurture that journey up to the six months time. I'm not going to pressure them in now. Um, but if they are ready to buy, then obviously we step into another another sort of process. So to get to that stage, I think you've got to identify your ideal customer profile. Um, so again, I'll go through that in the next slide. We'll talk about ideal customer profiles. And I know you've done this work already, Esther, so it might be a bit boring, but I will see if I can add anything to what you've already done. Um, and then once we know the sector or the area or the part of the general public you're targeting, which is your ideal customer profile, then we'll go into that buyer persona and who they are and then understand what's the journey they go on and map out that journey that they go on when they initially are aware mm -hmm. they've got a problem, they're mm -hmm. going through their consideration stage of all the different options to solve that problem, and then they're going into their decision stage of making a decision. So that's how we try and map it out. Um, and unfortunately, I don't get into buyer's journey much in this. It was in the last uh, session I did of lead generation, uh, which I may rerun at some time, but. If you want me to send you the video for that one, I can probably dig it out as well. Um, yes, please. In that, eh? Yes, please. Yeah, in that I go through the stages of the buyer's journey and what questions we ask at each of these stages where we start very general and then we get more specific, more detail driven as we go through our decision making process. So again, I think understanding the customer is the most important thing, but above that, what demographic, what sector are they in? So let's jump into that because I'm just aware of the time. We've only got 15 minutes left. Um, so an ideal customer profile really is a checklist of attributes that someone needs to be have to be successful as a customer. That's how we define it. Um, so it should be, do they tick these boxes? If yes, then they're one of our ideal customers. If not, then they're probably not. Um, so again, list, listing down firmographic details. If you're in a B2B like you are at the moment, it would be very much what size company, what turnover, how many employees do they need? You know, where are they in their business growth? You know, a lot of these things would be a binary yes or no. They either fit that or they don't. And that's what I'm trying to, as I say, that's what we're trying to do in our process at the moment. We're trying to get it down to a yes or a good fit or no, they're not. Simple as that. So we're never, ever wasting time with no, they're not, you know, and that's that's what we're trying to get to in a B2C environment like Krishna's in. It's going to be a section of the population. So if I was working with an estate agent, it would be homeowners in Lincolnshire. You know, that's who I would be targeting as the ideal customer profile. And then I would go into the buyer persona. So who is that homeowner? Is it Mrs. or Mr. who initially makes the inquiries and starts doing the research? Uh, and then I would define down the gender. So I've got I'll target female homeowners in Lincolnshire. 
and then this is their buyer persona of that person. They're usually about this age and these are their interests, you know, and that's, that's really how we build this out. Um, but initially, I've really got a checklist of five, five factors that say it's got to be a company in this area of this size with this many employees, uh, this much turnover. You know, I've got some pretty broad things that just narrow me in and it's usually sector based. It'll be usually be electrical engineering companies or it'll be engineering companies within Lincolnshire of this size. So, again, it just means that one, we become experts in that sector very quickly. We know what the conversations are in that industry. We can talk to them about things that are happening in their industry in initial sales conversations or initial conversations with them. But we also know we're not wasting time with anybody else. Those are the people. He ticks the boxes. I need to now be in front of the marketing manager or the operations manager or the FD. I need to be in front of these people uh, and start engaging with those people within these companies. Uh, so again, try and get to that yes they're a good fit or no they're not um then who's your primary buyer persona so now this is a rep representation of those people so again in a b2b scenario we will build out hr managers we've got and we give them names so we've got marketing mel's one of ours we've got owner owen we've got um who's a sales sam and we've got different personas that we give names and then we picture and really map out what they look like uh, because again, in B2B decisions, and you'll know because you've been in sales for so long, Esther, there's not one person involved in that decision. Yes, there may be the first person you contact who may become your champion within this deal that you're putting together, but there'll be a sphere of influence around them. There'll be multiple people who will be brought in at different stages to that decision making process. A bit easier on a B2C stage because your main target audience is going to be demographic and psychographic details. So who are they? and why do they buy? So psychographics is very much the reasons why they buy. Demographics is gender, age, um, geographic area, things like that. So understanding that from a B2C point of view and segmenting your audiences like that is really powerful. Um, and I think geographically for you, definitely Krishna, you want to understand are these local people, where's our biggest impact at the moment? And then build out from there. It doesn't mean you can't go national. It just means I would focus on campaigns to dominate the vegan and vegetarians within this 20 miles of where you live. Where was it? Huddersfield. Yeah. Yeah. So 20 within 20 miles of Huddersfield, you know, where do these people live and let's dominate them on Facebook and get in front of them as much as possible. Keep ourselves front of mind because uh, we know they're curry lovers. We know that they, you know, they regularly purchase uh, and we just were sharing recipes with them. They're showing interest in this. So, you know, who are those people? Is it male? Is it female? You know, I, I, I can see both for you, to be honest, because who would you say is you, you most often purchases the most often off you male or female it, equal equal 50 50 or is it 60, yeah, it, 60 40 no i think it it depends so if um if i'm if i'm looking at different areas so if we do an event in one area yeah it'd be probably 40 60 and it'd be male yeah whereas um possibly locally i've found that it's 50 50 mm -hmm. um so it it really does it really does depend um, you, you you just can't gauge that when you're looking no. when you're looking at people walking past you you know you think it's like you said Esther sometimes you think they're just not gonna they're just not gonna buy we well, smile at everybody yeah. but you know it's the, the ones that come up to you that, that surprise you are the nice ones and yeah. and recently it has been 50 15 but there know, will be a, there'll be a standout somewhere in your data as you start segmenting it there'll be a sort of a, a real I call it low hanging fruit where's the low hanging fruit first for us doesn't mean we ignore everyone else it just means that's where we focus our efforts first and then we move on to these other segments mm. well yeah i think it does just depend so like you were saying about um advertise um advertising um you know the traditional in through a publication yeah. uh, we just happened to have a piece in the yorkshire post that oh, we didn't great. pay for we just had and the number of sales from say men in uh, up i'd say over 50 50 and over yeah, yeah was phenomenal and it was like right okay you know and it it wasn't nothing was expected it was just free you see what happens it, it was a bit scat you know that's me really. krishna that's me from <laughs> from going from being at uni and going out for a beer and having a curry you see we've grown up with it it's like we want to exper experience everything now don't we 
Um, you know, even in lockdown, the cus the how the local our local curry house is so busy, and I think it's just because they do takeouts and you know, it just it just you couldn't be without it. So there's a real passion for it, and that's what you've got to play on, isn't it? You've got to yeah. So you've got to build up a very male orientated message and then a very female orientated. Yes, message, you know? I think that's the thing. I think that's where we have to pinpoint it. And, and I've got about eight avatars. So, yeah. So you may yeah. you're 50 plus males me. So, yeah. Curry Richard. <laughs> and then, I will, uh, I'll, name, I'll name that avatar after you. After me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's a 50 plus bloke and, you know, just what else is he interested in and, you know, what sort of cooking does he do, you know, because I, I don't hardly do any in the week, but then at the weekends I always want to dabble in the kitchen. So, you know, it's it's all these things that you've got to build on and it's not being stereotypical, it's just saying that's going to connect with more people than if I go very general and I'm not really talking to anyone. So pick two or three. I know you may have a lot of personas, but pick two or three and then yeah. start thinking, right, who's the main one in there? Look in your Facebook stats. That'll tell you as well in your Facebook. That's, pre- that's, that's more female, that one. Is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which would stand to reason because of the platform as well. Yeah. You know, a lot of us yeah. use Twitter, a lot of men use Twitter more or YouTube and things. So, but again, you've got data there. You've got some data to make these decisions on and to have some understanding. What age group is it say in your insights then on Facebook? Uh, for, for mine, it's um, 25 to, no, sorry, it's uh, 35 to 65. Women. Women. Yeah, there you go. So that's good. So you have got some steer there. And as I say, you're not trying to do all of this at once. You're sort of saying, right, let's focus on one group to start with and do well with that. So uh, And build your, pro, build your buyer personas out from that and then mature them, you know, as you learn more about these people. So do they read the Yorkshire Post or don't they? You know, is there a magazine that they read locally? You know, where do the vegans and vegetarians go? Are there any blogs they go to? You know, are there any Facebook groups they belong to? You know, you want to stimulate these so conversations. When you say that, I think this is, I've asked this question before in another group. When you say, um, Bill, how do you, how do you go about physically finding out if they read we the Yorkshire Post? Yeah, we do, we do what's you called, do. Perso- yeah, we do persona surveys. So we, right. when someone fits that criteria and they're bought off us, we then interview them and we ask them certain questions. Um, how did you find out about us is a good one as well because it, there's things that surprise us all the time what the way people have found out about us um so yeah do a persona interview i think i actually cover this somewhere uh if not i'll send you something on the questions to ask it's only four or five questions and we do it as a survey monkey survey that just goes out to everybody um so just set a free survey monkey account up and have it sent out to people once they bought off you perfect um, thank you yeah so as I say, that's the way I would do it. Um, and again, that's using, I have to actually come here, using data for your persona. Um, and it's it's guessing, a lot of this is guesstimates, but actually from your Facebook data, from existing customers, and again, your sales team, you know, you're talking to customers all the time. So, you know, who, who are these people? You know, start trying to understand them. And the sales team are a great source in B2B, B2B stuff, as I say, I just... Uh, always whenever I start working with any client I sit down with their sales team first that's one of my first goals because it drives my personas it drives my my sectors they're having success in I desire it drives what a good fit buyer looks like to them which can often be very different to the management and to the uh, to the marketing team um, so a lot of that helping the sales team succeed always helps your revenue grow it's as simple as that um, and social media as I say LinkedIn's a great source of information for B2B people. You know, I, I, I deliberately dig into anyone that I see as an entrepreneur, Eddie, in some of the sectors we're targeting. Uh, fire and security is one we do very well in. Um, waste and um, recycling um, and things like that are very waste companies are really good for us as well. Um, so people who own waste companies of a certain size. Um, and again, I always look at their roles within companies. So I, if I looked at Esther, I'd say, right, how's Esther being judged for success as well? Um, because again, for me, that's an important thing. How can I help Esther succeed? It's just as important because she may be my champion within a company. You know, same with marketing Mel. How, you know, what's she being judged on? Well, it's usually on lead generation or is it traffic or is it campaigns you're running? You know, and so understanding this is important and then, you know, saying to Esther, what, what do you, what blogs do you read? You know, what do you read on sales? What are your favorite books? What's, you know, all of these different sources. Um, who do you follow on LinkedIn? You know, have you got any groups you belong to? And uh, a lot of that's the important data that will just help you grow these personas out. 
Uh, I'll send you a copy of this. You've probably done them, something similar to this before, but again, this is the, the grid that we use um, when we map out our personas. So it's goals and values of the persona. Down the middle here is the demographic details. So giving them a name is an important thing for us. So we have marketing mail, people like that. What age are they? What gender are they? How many children have they got? Location, where are they geographically? And um, what's their occupation? What's their job title? Um, what sort of income levels have they got? Uh, I want all this because when I start using paid ads as well, I use this data. Once I really understand this data, I use it in my targeting on there. So no one else is seeing my ads other than my target buyers. Um, especially on LinkedIn, where you can spend a lot of money on ad campaigns if you don't target them correctly. Um, but if you set ad campaigns up properly and you do the same, as I was talking about earlier, by having custom audiences set up as well for people who see your ads, people who visit your website, things like that, you can get very accurate with this um, and ensure you're constantly in front of the right people. Challenges Sorry, can I just ask a quick question? How would you approach this if you're a brand new company and you didn't know anything? If you didn't know anything, I'd make guesstimates at this stage. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, you've got to. And and if you're doing that market research we talked about earlier, you'll start to see who your other competitors are targeting. You know, so have a look at your competitors. Who are they targeting? How are they talking to them? Um, but I think you've got it in your Facebook. Um, I, I can use, I think once you've got data of 100 people or more, you, you'll start to get this very quickly. Um, so even for new companies, you can make a guesstimate, but... I'd be doing more generic marketing to start with anyway, and then you'd get the data and really then zero in. Yeah, I don't think you can, a lot of this you can't do until you've got some data. And really you want client data to base this on as well, not just general people who are engaged with you because a lot will never buy. They're just tire kickers who you know, just uh, are on social media being a bit busy, so. Um, so yeah, challenges and pain points. Again, what are the main challenges that you usually come across with this buyer persona? You know, if it's an FD, I know he'll be looking to save money. So if I invest in this, Richard, how much money is it going to save me? Operations, people are always about being more efficient. So I'll, he'll want to know how much more efficient it's going to be. If it's a CEO or an owner of a business, it'll all be about revenue growth. You know, he won't really care about the the, uh, the small detail, he'll be looking as, from a helicopter point of view down on his business and saying, how's this going to help me grow it? Um, so again, just understanding those challenges and what they're trying to achieve. And again, a lot of this you can do through Facebook, you, uh, through LinkedIn, because you can see how they're being judged. So that'll be usually the main challenge. I need to generate more leads. It'll be a challenge for a marketer constantly. I need to generate better quality of leads. I need to create higher volume of leads or our web traffic or our paid campaigns or marketing campaigns aren't working properly. Um, so these are your pain points. And then where are their watering holes? Where do they go for sources of information? What books, what magazines, what blogs, um, what gurus or influencers do they follow? Um, again, this is a really key bit of knowing what sources of information they're after and what questions they're asking. You can find out a lot about in there as well. Uh, and then in a sales role, I'd always want to know what are the most likely objections this person's going to have in a buying decision. You know, what is it going to be price driven? Is it going to be I haven't got time to do this? Is it going to be resources? Um, uh, so I want to really understand for this buyer persona what they're objections are going to be because again for an fd if i'm talking to them i know it'll all be around price so i've got to address those early on so that makes sense yeah and say exactly the same for you krishna as i say understanding who it is uh, as a female 35 to 50 initially and then the ones that are over 50 as well maybe have a separate persona for them because uh, one's going to be probably a family one's going to be a family sort of a younger family mom type and then once they get older obviously the kids have probably left home there's other things you know husband and wife are probably looking to cook curries for a romantic friday night meal um and things like that so again understanding those drivers as they go from being a young teenager cooking a curry through their family life and up to um up to you know kids leaving home and what they're looking to do then is important uh, what time are we on? It's one o'clock. I'm going to get kicked off in a minute. Uh, persona interviews. Again, I'll let you read through this in the slide deck I send over for you. Um, but selecting 15 to 20 prospects or customers who fit this persona you've just mapped out and then asking them questions um, around 10 questions. And I always say just brainstorm these questions. Uh, cover the four topics here. What are their goals? What are their challenges? What are their watering holes? And what are their shopping preferences? Uh, when they buy something 
uh, what does the process look like? You know, try and understand a bit of that buyer's journey they've gone on. But if you can ask some questions around those three or four areas, it'll give you a real more accurate description of that person. Um, that's the link. And again, I'll, I'll get, uh, just let me pop that to that. That's the link that I was telling you about to our Leads and Revenue Masterclass. It's six videos, which covers all this in a bit more detail. Um, goes right through systems as well. So how to embrace something like HubSpot or use a system to measure a lot of this. And um, so I think you'll find both, both of you to find that useful to go through those six videos. Um, any questions? One minute past one. <laughs> probably got quite a lot of questions but unfortunately I do need to dash because I've got something else coming up. That's all right well richard um, at ignitegrowth.co.uk just anything you think of send me through I'm happy to answer any questions um, I know we've covered a lot today and it is hard in two hours that, that usually is a workshop I run in three hours that I've sort of tried to condense a bit for this. Um, it's been really handy. Has it been useful? Mm -hmm. Yeah Good. very much so yeah. Good. And it is often just thinking these questions through, isn't it? And uh, asking yourself them. Um, 